Okay. Good evening and welcome to um, our Oakley Cabin 25th anniversary Black History um, Month event. And we're going to be um, having the genealogy workshop. And our presenter here tonight is Jennifer Halsey. And Jennifer uh, has been um, has a degree in business administration and has worked in various industries to include tourism and hospitality. She is a trained and experienced tour guide for over 20 years in the D.C. metropolitan area. She has been a resident of Maryland, Prince George's County for 53 years, but not has not discovered any Maryland ancestry yet. She has been researching her family for 53 years and was always interested in family history and has notebooks full of stories told to her by her grandparents, great aunts and uncles, primarily on her paternal side. She is also very fortunate to have a photo album with many photos over 120 years old. Looking at these photos as a child, she wanted to know who these people were and about their lives. She became a serious researcher when she realized that her elders were passing away and no one was recording and collecting their stories. So I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer. Um, she's the, a family historian and she's going to um, take us through a journey, um, an introduction to uh, genealogy and family history. Good evening, everyone. Um, so glad you were able to attend tonight. I um, this is my first presentation ever, and my first virtual presentation. So I'm glad that you all were able to make it. I want to thank Cheryl and Tammy from Montgomery County Parks and Heritage. Uh, for allowing me to present and to share my genealogy knowledge with you this evening. All right, uh, this first slide is sort of a, just a little fun slide. Um, it basically it says, begins as an interest, evolves into a hobby, and becomes an obsession. Know the dangers, genealogy. And that is the truth. Basically, it started as an interest, wanted to find out about my family. Um, in looking at the photo album as a child, I wanted to know who are these people, you know, and, and what kind of lives did they live? And are they related to me? Are they family? Are they friends? You know, what happened to them? Who are they? Um, then it took over. It became a hobby. And now it's an obsession. And um, once you get into it, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about, that uh, that's all you talk about. You have to have your genie buddies, your genie friends who are interested also, because otherwise you will be boring other people to death talking about going to the cemetery to do some research. So uh, know the dangers uh, once you get involved in fit researching your family history. Oh, I think many of you recognize this photo. This is a photo of the 25th anniversary edition DVD of the Roots miniseries. The book Roots, written by Alex Haley, uh, debuted in, I believe it was 1976. A year later, they did the miniseries. And it was a blockbuster, to say mildly. Uh, Alex Haley won a Pulitzer Prize and numerous other awards for the book. Uh, people were glued to their television sets for, I believe it was eight nights in a row, watching the Roots series. Um, millions of Americans um, then became obsessed, as we would like to say, with researching their family history. Alex Haley started something, especially with African-Americans because they looked at Roots and they saw that he was able to trace his family from right here in nearby uh, Maryland in Annapolis where a young man, probably a teenage boy was captured in his homeland in Africa 
and carried across the ocean to land in Annapolis to eventually be sold further south. And he was able to do his research and trace the life of Kunta Kinte and his descendants, of which Alex Haley is one, back to Senegambia and uh, near Senegal. If you go to Annapolis today uh, on the docks, there is a statue of uh, Kunta Kinte. Uh, there's a plaque to talk about Alex Haley and the Lord Ligonier, the ship that brought him here. Um, a side note, um, Alex Haley's nephew, Christopher Haley, is a resident of Prince George's County, Maryland. And he is a filmmaker, a historian, and he is also the director of the study of the legacy of slavery in the state of Maryland, which is housed at the State Archives, which is also in Annapolis, Maryland. So I think that is just so fitting to um, bring that full circle. Um, prior to Roots, the TV series and the book, uh, the researching of family history, genealogy was primarily a hobby for, let's be frank, um, white, fairly wealthy people. No one else really had the time or the interest. No one else was really trying to claim their descendancy from the kings and the queens of Europe. But once uh, Alex Haley broke it open, um, that broke it open to many people to realizing that I too can uh, research my family and my family is just as important as um, wealthy, rich uh, noblemen. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, Alex Haley's nephew, Christopher, Chris Haley, is a resident of Prince George's County, Maryland, and he is in charge of the, he is a director of the study of the legacy of slavery in Maryland, which is housed at the Maryland State Archives located in Annapolis. So I think that's quite um, sort of the circle continues that uh, his uh, ancestor, Kunta Kinte, was brought to these shores and landed in um, Annapolis. And now a descendant of Kunta Kinte is working to um, expand the knowledge of uh, slavery, at least in the state of Maryland. You can go to the next slide. OK, how do you begin? This slide is just going to talk about some of the steps that you would go through. And then as I go through the presentation, I will go in more detail about each of these steps. But one of the first things you do is you gather documents that are in your possession or in possession of family members. And again, I'll talk in more detail about that. Second thing is to be organized. I learned the hard way. You've got to be organized. You will be collecting mounds of paper, mounds of data. And if you're not organized, you will drive yourself crazy and you will spend money where you don't need to spend. I did not, I was not organized when I started. It took me many years to be organized. And what happened is I paid $17 for a particular document out of state. And once I paid the $17 and received a horrible digital copy of the document, it was a death certificate, I realized that I already had the document for free. But because I wasn't organized, I didn't realize that. So you must be organized. Uh, one of the things that you need to do is create a filing system that works for you. And that's critical. That works for you. Um, some people want to keep everything on their computer. Some people like me are paper people. I use three ring binders. Some people use file cabinets. Eventually you will find a filing system that works for you. 
You may want to separate your families by the states that you're researching. You may want to separate your families by surnames, last names. It just depends on your system, your work uh, style, whatever works for you so that you can find what you need. After you've collected documents, personal documents from your home and whatever, then you're going to start searching for vital records. Vital records are birth, death, marriage records that are um, created uh, by the state. And um, we'll talk about that later, why that's so important. Then you have your census research, which is a lot of people are very familiar with this. The census is taken every 10 years by the United States government. And there is quite a lot of information that's available on the census forms that will help you in locating your family. And then of course, there are the online databases. And then there is still paper. There are still many records that are not online, which means that you will need to go to a local repository or a repository in the cities or counties that you're researching, which could be a library, another state archives, uh, a historical society. So we'll talk about all those things a little bit later. Next slide. Let me know about my time because I can talk forever. Next slide. Can they hear me? Jennifer, your slide's there. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, when I talked about um, getting started, one of the things that is, is critical, in, um, if you can, is to interview as many of your elders as you can. Um, it's a terrible feeling to realize that, you know, they have passed on and they've taken, in most cases, and they didn't write it down. They didn't write the family story down. They didn't write the family history down. And so all of that information is gone. So if you have grandparents, great grandparents, great aunts, uncles, family friends who are getting up in age, your parents, um, interview them. Interview them and try to get as much as possible. Uh, the form that you see off to the right says collecting family history, the interview. This is just an example of one type of interview form. In the resource list that you received, um, there are links to where you can find many different types of forms. This is just to give you a start a Kickstarter. Um, they ask questions like um, your name, where were you born, when were you born, your date of birth, do you have siblings, um, who are they, what are their ages, what are their names, what are your parents' names, where were they born, um, how did they meet, uh, where did you grow up, uh, where did you go to school, what were the occupations of your family members? What was your occupation if you're talking to someone who's uh, retired? Was there any military service? Um, now with uh, tape recorders, your cell phones, a lot of this can be recorded, but you have to make sure that you ask permission. You just don't wanna record someone on the sly. Um, you wanna ask permission. Um, you also, um, may think that some of these questions are like, well, I know the answer to this question. I know how old she is. I know how old he is. I know where he was born. But do you really? Um, you still need to ask these questions because you may have a relative who you've always known as Aunt Sue. But maybe Sue isn't really her name. Maybe uh, her birth name. Maybe she had another name that she was given at birth, but she decided for whatever reason, somewhere along the line, I don't wanna be called that. And so that is very helpful because you could be researching the wrong person or you could say, I can never find any records for Aunt Sue because all her records are under her official name of, let's say Barbara. So you wanna make sure that you try to get as many questions answered as possible I, always, I would recommend that you do these if you're working with uh, elderly, 
people that you do these in short burst. You don't want to wear out your welcome. You don't want to tire people out. Um, so uh, let's see what else do I have to say about that. Uh, yeah, let me go to the next slide. This is another example of a form. Um, this is not really an oral history form. This is sort of uh, what I would call the uh, form that you would use when after you've collected the information and you want to drill it down to um, maybe the important details or what you think are the most succinct details. And this is an example of a form that might be used later on to go in a family uh, reunion guide that you might want to put together. You see there's a space for the photo of the person and their basic vital information, and then possibly just room for a paragraph or two about this person. And uh, this is just another example of uh, getting down data. Um, in my family, I have not really used um, uh, official forms. I do have some people that I was able to interview um, and uh, record the information, but I've had to practice what I call stealth genealogy. And what I do is at family get togethers, at holiday times, I will just maybe ask a question about someone or, oh, do you remember when such and such happened or when so-and-so came to visit? And uh, I always, I have little scraps of paper, which is not a good thing, but you do what you gotta do, where I have actually taken a paper napkin and written down, you know, things that my great aunt just out of the blue happened to say. So um, I am in the process of transcribing all that information into other documents. But um, you collect the information any way you can. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a list of some of the documents that you would be collecting. And most of these documents are going to be in your home or in the home of a family member. Um, for exceptions, there may be um, some vital documents that are not there, um, depending on the age of the person or whatever. But for the most part, you are going to find these documents somewhere in the home, in a drawer. Uh, in stuck in the back of the family Bible. Um, you're going to find them in a desktop, uh, just can be anywhere. Um, I think I, I composed this list because I have just about every single one of these documents for um, my family. I have birth certificates, baptismal certificates, uh, the family Bible, I have announcements of birth, marriage, and death. I have diplomas from high school, from college, um, letters, and scrapbooks, photo albums, and valuable. Address books, old address books that my mother had of her friends. Um, expired passports, let me know where they had been, traveled. I have medical records. Um, which is very, you know, interesting to see, you know, maybe what, you don't know what that person may have been uh, treated for. Um, employment records, where they worked, where they retired from, uh, club and fraternal memberships, sororities, uh, Masonic, uh, Masonic uh, organizations, the Elks. Um, I know, for example, when I found my baptismal certificate, which I didn't even think was something that I was looking for, but I did find it in my mother's possessions. My brother and I had been baptized at the same church here in Washington, DC on the same day. It was also the same church that my parents were married at. It was also the same church that my grandparents were married at. So there is a lot of information um, just from that one institution which builds on my family story. 
So I can say that I have a family story centered around this particular church. Okay, you can go to the next slide. This is a uh, slide of the Washington DC Family History Center showing you uh, what their uh, space looks like. Uh, the Washington DC Family History Center is run by the Church of the Latter-day Saints, uh, which we informally call the Mormon Church. Um, as part of their religious beliefs is that we are the family of man that everyone is related and that they are encouraging research into the giant, the worldwide family tree. And so they have set up family research centers in every state and in almost every country in the world. These centers are free. They are staffed by volunteers. Uh, right now, of course, because of COVID, they're all closed. <laughs> but once we were out of COVID and they reopen, this, these centers are amazing. There are centers in Suitland. I believe there are Suitlands in, uh, centers in Laurel. But the Washington, D.C. Family History Center in Kensington is the largest and also offers the most services. An example is they have subscriptions to all the well-known databases, such as FamilySearch, of course, Ancestry, Fold3, which holds military records. They have six computers, 12 computers on site, six printers, three microfilm readers and printers. They have flatbed scanners. They also offer classes, free classes, which are excellent in explaining and helping you in all kinds of research matters. Um, they also have what are called SIGs, S-I-G, abbreviation, special interest groups. There is a special in interest group of African-American researchers. There's a special interest group for people, um, possibly, I believe it's from, the, from Greece. So, um, they may have a special interest group of our, from people researching in Ireland. It just depends on what the person who is volunteering decides that there's enough inf um, interest. They will form a special interest group and they usually meet once a month and discuss uh, their topic. Uh, one of the other special interest groups is for DNA. Uh, there's another special interest group that focuses on technology related to genealogy. So um, this is also in your handout, a link to the Washington DC Family History Center, um, but it is a great resource. Next slide. Okay, this is one of our vital records that you will want to uh, gather as one of your first documents. This is, I'm showing an example of a marriage certificate. On the left-hand side where you see the, you can see the text a little bit more clearly. This is uh, North Carolina, and this is actually um, my great-grandfather and great-grandmother uh, marriage certificate. The, cert the photo is not a family member. Just pulled that off the internet, so don't, don't think that's any of my family. <laughs> Uh, the image on the right-hand side is an example of a marriage certificate that you may find in someone's personal possession. This is not necessarily a certificate that was issued by the state. This is more of a, maybe the church offered this, or maybe it was filled out after the wedding as a more decorative um, certificate of marriage that would have been, you would have found that hanging on the wall in the home. The image on the left is a state issued document. And I was able to find this online. And this shows um, my great grandfather and great grandmother in December 28th, 1882. 
Let's see, I think it was 1882, yes. You can go to the next slide. This is another vital record. This is a, an Im image of a birth certificate. Um, birth certificates have quite a bit of information that will help you in your research. Um, every state has their own form, but there's a generally a standard um, questions that are asked on the forms. Of course, the date of birth, name of the child, where they were born. You can see that this was Dallas County in the city of Dallas. Um, it lists who her parents were, who the father is. It also lists his race and where he was born and his occupation. On the other side, you have the list of the mother, where she was living, her race, her place of birth, and her occupation. And at the bottom, you can see um, the time of the birth, the doctor, and of course the date again when this was registered. So you can see there might be a slight difference. The date at the top of the form, October 1st, 1918, was a date of birth and the actual form was registered on the 11th. But there's a wealth of information on birth certificates. Um, Cheryl, if you can go back to the, the marriage certificate, just one back. Uh, if you look at the document of, on my um, grand, great grandparents, I forgot to tell you, the document asks for their names, their ages, whether their parents are living or deceased, the names of their parents. And then at the bottom, there is a list of witnesses to this marriage. And that can turn out to be a valuable clue when you're researching, because in this case, I know some of those names are familiar that I've heard my grandparents talk about these people. And so they could have been cousins, they could have been um, close family friends, but it pays to read the entire document because it's full of information that will help you uh, further in your research. Okay, you can skip the birth certificate and go on to, I don't know, it's, uh, skip that one, did that one. Okay, this is another vital record. This is a death certificate. Um, as I said in the text, it says it seems to have all the information that you need, a birth date, the parents' names, the death and place of death, cause of death, and the burial site, and also where the deceased was living at the time, their occupation, and their marital status. Um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about this form? This is my uh, great-grandfather the one that you saw in the, um, I'm sorry, this is my great grandmother, the one that you saw in the uh, marriage certificate. And you can see that this has female, she was colored. Uh, I'm sorry, this is his, oh, I'm getting myself confused. Um, colored, a list at the bottom, if you keep going, it'll say her father's name. Now this is information that I did not have. I had nothing to, to let me know who her father was. But here, somebody has filled it out. The informant has written Moses Spruill. Okay, have I heard that name? You know, I, I make a note. Have I heard that name before? Does that seem logical? Make a note of that. Then I see a Mingle Whibby. Hmm, I'm thinking, I'm not sure about that name. Then it gets down to the informant. I know that name. That was my great uncle, my grandmother's brother, one of her brothers. So he was the informant. And that's going to be a clue later on when you're going further into your research. If you go over to the right-hand side, you can see how long she was cared for by the doctor. Um, how long was she supposedly ill? Um, 
and what did she die from? A lot of the terminology that they use for diseases and disorders, um, the names have kind of changed. So sometimes you'll read these and you'll be like, what in the world is that? But it says here, I believe, pancreatic cancer, which is um, uh, fairly um, common name. So I recognize that. And then down at the very bottom, it says that she was buried in Plymouth, North Carolina, which was the town, but it does not give a location, which leads me to think that she was buried at the homestead in the family graveyard in the back of the home, but I'm not sure. And then it gives the name of the undertaker. And that company, you can also find out if those companies are still in business. If they're still in business, they may allow you to have access to um, their files. It may give you some more information about your family. This company is no longer in business, um, but that does not mean that their records have not survived. They may be in an archives, they may be in a historical society, they may have been taken over by another company. I have to do the research on that. Okay, we can flip to the next slide. This is another death certificate. And the reason I put two death certificates in here is I wanted to show you how they're used in the information. This is John Walker, who was my great grandfather who was married to Rosa Walker, who was on the previous death certificate and also on the marriage certificate. Okay, I'm not seeing my slide. Not sure what's happening. Cheryl, I'm looking at just a logo. I can still talk without a slide, but. There you go. There oh, you go. Can, you, can you take me back to the death certificate? I, I hit the wrong button. I'm so sorry. It's okay. That's all right. We got time. This is our first time, so we're going to have a glitch or two. That's all right. We good? I'm still looking at the. 1870 census, if you could go back to the death certificate, vital records death certificate. You want? Yeah, I think it's the one before this. Yeah. There we go. Yes. Okay. Um, what I was saying is that I wanted to show you two death certificates. Um, you don't have to go back. You don't have to flip the screen back. But the death certificate for Rosa Walker, she died in 1925 and all this information that you see place of death county state her age um who her parents were were all listed on that form this is for her husband who died many many years later and the form changed still asking some of the same questions but not exactly. So when I found this form, I was very excited. I was like, great, I've got his death certificate. I made a copy of it, put it in my little file and went on about my business. That was about probably six or seven years ago. Last year, somebody said something that triggered something in me. And I said, wait a minute, I said, no, that, that's not right. We were talking about, I think, his date of death or something. So I went back and I really looked at this form, which is something that you should do once you get your um, documents. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. You really need to, as one genealogist, Shelly Murphy says, wring a record dry. You need to look at this document and go line by line. 
And one of the things that I was told in a workshop, which is great information, is you need to transcribe, which means copy this information onto another form. And in the process of copying it and reading this document, you will see information that you didn't see before. And so what happened to me is I looked at this document and it says here they don't ask for, um, on Rosa's, they did not ask for her date of birth. They just had her date of death, which was 1925, and her age at that time. So you would have to calculate, okay, uh, do my little math, 1925, she was 63. So that means that she was born somewhere around 1862. On this form, they ask, what year was he born and how old was he when he died? So I'm like, great. And then I also have his date of death. So you've got three dates there. Like I said before, I just didn't pay any attention to it. I thought, okay, this is the information. But when I went back, and I did my calculations and I looked at this, I said, well, he would have been 18 um, at the time of, um, in 1906, when my grandmother, my grandmother, one of his youngest daughters was born in 1906. And I said, he would have been 18 at her birth, which is not out of out of concert, it's not out of re reality. But I knew that my grandmother was one of the youngest of 11 children. So I said, mm, I don't think this 1888 date is correct because he would have started having to start fathering children at about age 10. <laughs> and I said, I don't think that's true. So what was I supposed to do? How am I supposed to verify? You know, I know that this 1888 date is not coming out right, but I knew that I had his marriage certificate. And his marriage certificate is what we call, it's a vital document, but it's also a primary source document because that document, that marriage document was created closer to the event. That marriage document was signed by my great grandparents. So they got married on the 28th of December and they signed that document on the 28th of December. John Walker couldn't sign this document. He was deceased. This is the informant that is giving this information. Again, this is his son that's giving the information. I'm sorry, his daughter that's giving the information, my grandmother. And I'm thinking that under stress of bereavement that somehow his date of death was recorded, I mean, his date of birth was recorded incorrectly. If I had not had the marriage certificate and a few census documents, I would not have realized that this date was incorrect. So I just want you all to understand that, you know, just because it's on this form, this government issued form, the information is given by a person and it may not be accurate because this is the, the, the son and he may not have all the information. So um, a long explanation, but I hope um, that helped you understand why I'm trying to show that you really need to read these documents carefully. Hi, Jennifer, I have a question. Sure. So um, you um, shared the, um, your, um, the funeral homes that were, were they both um, taken care of by the same funeral homes, those both death certificates that you had? Uh, let's see What's here. I don't want to see a funeral home. Let's, let me see here. I'm looking at you said paper. that the funeral home was no longer there. I yeah, saw that yeah. last one. It said Toodles. Yeah, Toodles is still there. Yeah, so the Toodles other thing is still there, but Slade and Toe, which was on uh, 25 years ahead for my great grandmother, they are oh. no longer in business. But oh, Toodles okay. is still there. Oh, okay. Okay. Because yeah, I noticed and, that you said they were the same yeah. in yeah. the same area, and I yeah. was wondering there was more. Okay. Yeah, Toodles is still there. And that's an example of uh, another thing Tammy pointed out, that 
you see the funeral home is listed here. So that funeral home is still in business. They have a burial ground as part of the funeral home. So that is another place that you can go and do research. Uh, genealogists love cemeteries. <laughs> We can't drive past the cemetery. We're like, oh, look at what's up in there. See what's going on. So, um, sounds weird, but yep. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's great. Yep. Okay, the 1870 census. Uh, again, as I said, the census is mandated by Congress to happen every 10 years. And it's essentially a count. It's supposed to be a count of every single person in the United States. And it's taken every 10 years by uh, law. And it's been happening since 1790. So there is a census every 10 years that exists from 1790 to the most recent, which was just done in 2020. However, however, the 1890 census, um, most of that does not long, no longer exist because of a fire that happened at the records um, and most of the records were burned. So that creates, so we call it the 1890 brick wall, but that doesn't mean you can't find any information. That's just to let you know that there is no 1890 census, so don't try looking for one because in most cases, their fragments were left of the census, and I believe it's like maybe five states that have information. But other than that, there is no 1890 census. Um, the reason I put the 1870 census up here is, as you can see, it says this was the first census that was done after emancipation. So if your family was enslaved, the eight, and they were enslaved, they were not free, the 1870 census is going to be the first census where you will be able to find them. You will be able to find them listed by name because prior to 1870, we were not considered people. We were property, so we were listed along with the cows and the farm equipment and not named primarily most of the time. If you find your people on an 1860 census or I would say any census prior to 1870, that means in most cases they were free, free blacks. But most African-Americans, uh, I won't say most, I hate to say that, but for a, a large portion of African-Americans, the 1870 census is, um, breaks down a um, brick wall for us. Uh, you can flip to the next one. Also, I wanted to say that the um, census is done every 10 years. Um, we just had one in 2020. The information on individual people is kept private for 72 years. So that means that right now, the most recent census that we have available data uh, on people is 1940. And the 1950 census will become available in April, 2022. But right now we're, we're only allowed to view data from the 18, I mean, the uh, 1940 census. Uh, the 1870 census um, had uh, several uh, what they call additional schedules. And one of the schedules was the agricultural schedule. And this is great because, again, we're being counted as a person. And on the 1870 schedule, you can't really see from this image but the census, uh, 1870 agricultural census, um, identifies whether or not you were a farmer, a landowner, a laborer, a tenant farmer. So it also shows um, the economic growth of the African-American community. So many people have been able to find that their family 
were landowners or became landowners. And that's an amazing thing to think that the Civil War had ended and just five years later, here people were farming their own land. And because there are, you are also enumerating, you are also gathering information on the entire community, you will sometimes see on the census forms, um, the black family, and that was enslaved is living right next door to the white family that enslaved them. And many times they are farming or working, sharecropping on land that um, they had worked on as enslaved people. And in many times these people could possibly be family members. And you're gonna have to come back to the 1870 census and prior previous census and many times in order to you have to research the slave owner and this is many cases how you may be able to find out who the last slave owner of your family was because they many times are living right next door to each other sharing the land okay we can flip to the next page this is also another schedule for the 1870 uh, census. And this also sort of gets down into the money. This shows um, uh, what crops they were growing. Uh, was it a tobacco farm? Was it a corn farm? Was it a wheat farm? Uh, how many machines did they have? How many tractors did they have? How many mules did they have? Uh, did they have uh, hoes? Did they have, you know, it just talks about the production, the business, as I said, the industrial manufacturer census schedule. So this is also helpful to see what type of work people were doing, how much money they were making, um, and what they owned. Um, and these were also done in 1850 and 1860. But again, most African Americans were not on those census unless they were free. So 1870, Census, industrial manufacturing, and agricultural schedules are very important. Very important. All right, we go to the next slide. How am I on time? All right, this is just, and it, this is not a form that you would necessarily fill out. This is just trying to show you that. If you can see at the top, it says 1790, and then um, this is a two-page form. So the front side of this form goes from 1790 to 1860, each census. And what they're telling you is at every census has the different columns. And the columns change from year to year, I mean, from decade to decade. They don't, the census does not necessarily ask the same information uh, every year. They, they'll always ask for your name, um, but instead of asking for an age, they may ask for a date of birth. Um, they may ask um, where you were born, and it may just be uh, the state. Some places will have space for a county. It just depends. So this form lets you look at quick glance, lets you know what information am I going to get from the 1860 census? You know, if they filled it out completely and entirely, what information is asked on this form? Um, because often it's very hard to see, even on um, a digitized form online, you have to blow it up and it's got scribbly handwriting or a big ink blob right where you need to read something. So this way you can just say, oh, this column here, this is the information that they're asking. And it helps you in breaking it down. Um, the backside completes the census up to 1930. Same thing, just all the column headings. And um, I wanted to um, give you, again, a family story. The 1910 census, I had collected that for most of my family. And if they were alive in 1910, I said, they gotta be on the census, I'm gonna find them. 
So I had pulled the census uh, document for my great, great, great grandmother and my four times grandmother. And I was so excited. There they were listed on the census. I got their names and their ages. That's all I cared about. Again, made a copy, filed it away. A couple of years later, again, I was doing what I should have done in the first place. I was taking that information off of that form and copying it onto a blank piece of paper. So I get to one of the columns that was way down at the end of the form. And that column said, how many children did you give birth to? For all females, it said, how many children did you give birth to? And the next question was, how many of those children are still living? Well, when I got to my great four times grandmother, it said that she had given birth to 22 children. And the only one that was still living was the one that she was living with on that census form was the daughter who was my great, great grandmother. And I had never, never heard of any of her other children. I was only concerned with Cassandra, who was my three times grandmother. And it never occurred to me that there were other children. And it never occurred to me that there were 22 children that she says she gave birth to. Who they are, who their fathers were, if there was more than one man, they were all born into slavery, I assume. I don't know anything, but that is the information that you will get when you read the entire form and just don't stop at name and age and maybe place of birth. I also found um, on the 1940 census at the very end of the form, squeezed into that last column, information on a great grandfather who I was always told had worked in the federal government. But there was some scribbling in that last column and I was trying to make it out. I enlarged it, I kept blowing it up, blowing it up. And I said, what does this say? Finally, I read it, it said proprietor. I said, proprietor? I said, that means he had a business. I had never heard about him having a business, but he's telling this census taker in 1940 that he's a proprietor. In addition to working in the, for the federal government, he is a proprietor. And then it had what that business was, boot black. He must have owned a shoe shine parlor. And he was a proprietor. Never heard that information from any of my family members. So that was another little nugget of information that I got from reading the census forms. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Is it delayed? Ah, here we go. All right, this slide goes back to what I had started out in the beginning saying about being organized. Um, and you will be collecting a lot of data. As you can see, you'll be collecting data from vital records, birth, marriage, death certificates. You'll be collecting uh, data from all the documents that you found in the house, the birth certificate, uh, the uh, baptismal certificates, the maybe the graduation announcements, and you'll be collecting data from the census forms. And in order to keep yourself organized so you know what you've got, a lot of genealogists use a timeline. This is just one example. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples of a timeline form. Some people don't even use a form. I know one genealogist says she just opens up a Word document and every time she finds an information on her, this particular person, she just inserts it into the Word document and then she just keeps going. She just keeps a Word document for that person at the header with his name, uh, date of birth, place of birth, and then she just keeps going. Um, 
A lot of people, if you're a chart person, some people use Excel spreadsheets. This is just one example. And the way I use this form is I handwrite it. I don't use a PDF, I handwrite it. And I will put, let's say, um, the date of the document is 1930. And it's a birth certificate. So that will go under uh, possibly, uh, I'll put birth under event. And then the location would be North Carolina, possibly, or Plymouth, North Carolina, as much information as I can get. And then in resource citation, I'll put it was a birth certificate that I found on ancestry.com or family search. And then if I have any notes or questions about this birth certificate, I can put that under notes and question. And then I just put the date that I did it. And then in next steps, I can put possibly research uh, hospital um, or something like that. So this is just one form that you can use and you would do one form per every person that you're researching. And what happens is once you fill out these forms and you put them in date order and you say, OK, I've got them. They were born in 1930. So I got them on the 1930 census. I got them on the 1940 census. I got a marriage certificate in 1941. I've got a graduation certificate in 1955. I've got a death certificate in 1970 or whatever it is. Put these things on this timeline and date order for that person. And then you can go back and look and say, well, what am I missing? There's a gap between 1930 and 1940. I have nothing on them. I know they were alive because they're on the 1940 census. I know they were alive in 1930, but what was going on between 1930 and 1940? I don't have anything. Were they in the military? Were they living overseas? Were they in prison? Were they, you know, where were they? So that's what the timeline is really good for. It organizes you, but it also lets you know what you have and what you don't have. And it leads you to your next uh, research area. Okay, next slide. This is a lineage form. This is another form. This is sort of, I consider this more kind of advanced genealogy. I don't really use these too much. Um, once you start using a genealogy software, it probably becomes a lot easier to complete these types of forms. Um, basically what this is, is a who begat who. So and so got married and had John, Sue, Jane, and Bob. And so you just list who the parents were, the children in order of birth, where they were born, date they were born, possibly who they married. And uh, this is just the lineage straight, just a couple of few facts about everybody and you keep this. And this is um, also designed to keep you organized and to keep families together. Again, this is just one of many styles of forms and uh, you can Google uh, lineage forms, family group sheet. Uh, also in the resource list, I have a link to where you can get a lot of these blank forms, but there's all different types of styles, um, but it's mainly asked the same information. And again, this is just a form to help you keep organized, keep your data organized. Okay, next slide. This is another form for organization. This is for military information. Um, African Americans have served since before this was the United States of America. And there are records. Um, so if you may not think that your family served in the Revolutionary War or the War of 1812, but could be, could have been a Buffalo soldier, could have uh, been in every war, every war that this country has fought, every conflict African-Americans have fought. What these forms do 
is help you keep track of your family members and their military service. Um, the one on the um, left-hand side lists just about every conflict and every war. So it kind of makes it easy. You can just put a name and then you can just put a little check mark and say, oh yeah, World War I, World War II, Korea. And um, then the second form gives you a little bit more um, space to write um, more details. What was their branch of service? What was their rank? Um, did they win any awards or medals? And where did you get that information from? And um, this is um, also very important information. Uh, last, what was it, two years ago, Memorial Day, um, it was a big family weekend for us. We had, my daughter was graduating from college. My nephew was graduating from high school. So in the span of bookend weekends, we had family cookouts. And as I said, I practice stealth genealogy. My family does not necessarily have reunion. So I have to get the information where I can. So what I did with the help of my brother, who is, we are a military family. My father, my uncle, my father's brother, my brother, my nephew are all career military. Three of them retired, one is active duty. Um, and then we have other family men members who have served in the reserves. So um, I grew up as a military brat. So we have a lot of friends and family that are military. So what I did is we prepared uh, poster sized boards and we had photos and information on every single family member and family friend, where they had served, what branch of the service. We had information um, going all the way back to a possible US colored troop uh, from the Civil War. Um, and we put that information on poster boards and we set it up on easels. And family, and I decorated with the red, white, and the blue and, and, the, and the flags and everything. And we had them set up so outside and the family members were really, really appreciative. They really were excited to see, and most of them were not aware of the information. So um, that way I was able to, you know, get people talking and interested and in, in about uh, the family history. Okay, let's go to the next. Again, another organized form, uh, another family group record sheet. Um, this one has a little bit more um, detail and a little bit more space uh, if you're writing by hand. And then, again, you can see it's just asking for everything. You will prepare this one of these sheets for every family group. So you can see you have the husband, all his information, the wife. And again, when you're recording information on women, even though they are get married, you always are recording them by their maiden name so that you can find them in the records using their maiden name. And then eventually you may wanna make a copy of the file and put it under the married name. But when you're researching, you use the woman's maiden name. And then it lists all the children, when and where they were born, and then, and in order, you're putting them in birth order. And then at the bottom where it says footnotes, you can write any kind of comments or something that may jog your memory. Okay, you can switch, you can go to the next one. Um, I wanted to just talk about um, digital technology and, um, genealogy. Um, before, now every night on television, there's a commercial for Ancestry. Um, they're mostly focusing on their um, DNA, but Ancestry is a, has a database. They are a for-profit company. Family Search also has a database of records. They are a nonprofit church organization. They 
have taken upon themselves to digitize, to put up thousands and thousands, or I should say millions and millions and tens of millions, I say records online. So that back in the olden days, back in the olden days when I got started in genealogy, I had to go downtown to the National Archives and I had to sit in a dark room and crank reels of microfilm till I found what I was looking for. And then I had to hit the print button and print out an 11 by 14 sheet or whatever, and then go and pay for it and then get home and then have my, you know, pray that I printed out the right page. Now, so many, many, many of those records are online. And all you got to do is log into the Library of Congress, the National Archives, Family Search, Ancestry, and you can research in your pajamas at home till three o'clock in the morning um, once you have access. So um, that has really revolutionized um, genealogy. Um, you can go to Roots Tech. You can switch to the next slide. Roots Tech, let's see, I'm, go back, go back. Uh, Roots Tech is a conference that's put on by Family Search every year. And it is, I've never attended in person, so I'm not going to say, but it is the dream of every genealogist to eventually one day get to Salt Lake City, where the massive library of genealogy is housed. They have millions and millions and millions of records that they have digitized that are stored on microfilm in caves in Utah. And they have this mammoth library that is connected. That is the mother library of all of these family history center libraries, like the one in Kensington. But they put on a conference every year out in Salt Lake City in February, and they charge a small fee, maybe around two, $250 to attend. Well, this year, because of COVID, they are going virtual, and it is free. There is no fee. And what it is, is you are going to be able to take classes, webinars, on researching your family history. You will be able to take classes in technology, in methodology, on um, if you have Irish ancestry, Swedish ancestry, German ancestry, whatever, African ancestry, whatever your ethnic group is, they have a class for you. All you have to do is go to rootstech.org and it takes two minutes, you sign up and you're in. And then they will send you um, periodic emails. And on the day of the conference, you will be logged in. And uh, from what I understand, all the classes are on demand. They have been pre-recorded. So if you cannot log on at when they go live, they will be posted and ready for you to look at at any time. They will also have an expo hall, which is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous for genealogists, where all kinds of vendors offering all kinds of products related to genealogy study will be in attendance. And this is also a good time to, many of them will be probably be offering sales and deals. So if there's a software package that you've been waiting on, if there's a book that you been putting off wanting to buy, if there are uh, some guidebooks, all of that will be available. Um, they'll have people who can help you in photo restoration. If you have old family photos, there'll be people who can, um, you can pay and they'll do the research for you and present you with a beautiful um, family album. Um, that they researched, um, just you name it. So it doesn't cost you anything. You can just sign up. 
You do have to have a family search account, but again, that's very easy to set up and they are very good about helping you. Okay, this one of the last slides here is DNA. Um, most people have probably heard about it. Uh, like I said, every night Ancestry has a commercial on TV about DNA. Um, what I have to say about DNA is that it is one tool, one tool to use in your genealogy research. You still are going to have to go to the paper, to the digitized paper. DNA is useful for filling in gaps, but it is not going to get you all your answers. And again, there, you have to be very, very careful about using DNA and getting tested because DNA is science and it does not lie. So if you are the least bit apprehensive of what you may find, do not get tested. Do not get a DNA test because it may uh, bring up something that you are just not ready to deal with. So in wrapping up, I just want to say, just get started. Just dive in. Don't You don't have to have any special equipment. You can get a free account on Family Search. Just sign up and just Start plugging in those surnames and see what comes up. You'd be surprised. Uh, get organized. Again, some type of filing system, some type, whether it's online or um, a file cabinet, a file drawer, get organized. Uh, get focused. Um, what I mean by focused is it's very easy to get distracted. You're looking at one type of record and then you say, oh, let me go over here and look at this. If you say, I want to find out who my great grandfather was, stick to that. Give yourself some time until you think you've gone as far as you can go with that one particular research project. And then if you feel like you're stuck, you can set it aside and go on to something else and go on to researching someone else. But it helps to stay focused on that one person or that one research problem. Uh, get social. There are so many websites, uh, Facebook sites out here that are invaluable. One of the things I would suggest you do is once you decided on the area that you're researching, uh, let's say for, I'll use myself as an example. North Carolina, that's my paternal family, is from North Carolina. There is a historical society for just about every county and town in America. No matter how small, they're going to have a historical society um, for that town or that community. And they will most likely have a Facebook page because Facebook is free. And I would just go on Facebook, if you have an account, get one and join the historical society for your state and your county and your towns of research because they are full of people who are willing to help you and for free. And you can just post, I'm looking for Sam Jones who was born in 1878 in Garrett County, Tennessee. And in five minutes, I guarantee you'll have somebody writing back and giving you information. So definitely get online, get social, use uh, Facebook especially. There are also many groups, just about every organization has a Facebook page. So I would join that. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank well, you. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. And you have a comment here. Um, Someone wants to say to you that you were terrific. And are you sure you have not done this workshop before, Jennifer? I um, have not. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it this you... way. I have not presented it before. I, I've done it a million times in my house, but I haven't presented. No. Yes, yes. So if anyone has any questions, we'd be glad to take them. This is a um, part of a series of workshops that we're going to be working on to really get some more background history on Oakley Cabin descendants. People who came out of that cabin. 
Um, that last year we celebrated 25 years with Oakley Cabin uh, being a historic site for Montgomery Parks. And so we didn't really get to do much last year. And so we're extending that celebration into this year where we're putting together workshops and really starting to dig into the research that's necessary for us to really uncover the, the narrative of all the people who um, after emancipation made their lives um, there and um, are probably still located in Montgomery County. So we're looking forward for you all to participate in um, many of our other workshops. You can find that information at history, www.historyintheparks.org where you found those. There's some several other workshops um, for the Josiah Henson Museum coming up um, before the end of this wonderful Black History Month in 2021. And we look forward for you all joining us in some of our other um, workshops. So let me have, there's a few questions here that I um, okay. want to um, put out here. Everyone saying, thank you, awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, oh, you're welcome. So, um, Je um, Jennifer, there are some um, historical societies that you're a member of. Would you like to share about some of the uh, places where people can connect with um, you know, the African-American historical societies that really focus on Black um, history and heritage? Yes, uh, I would say the main organization, and it's on the handout, it's called AUGS, Afro-American History and Genealogy Society. They're a national organization. It was started here in Washington, D.C., but we're a national organization, and we have chapters and many, many states and cities around the United States. And if you go to your handout, there should be a link to AUGS National. And you um, it's an annual membership um, for the national, which is a very affordable, I believe it's uh, $50. Um, and then there are each chapter, each regional chapter has um, its own dues, which are minimal, maybe $20 a year. And the information that you get, they put on workshops, classes. In fact, last Saturday was the DMV, the local AUGS chapters. There's, uh, I believe, five from Baltimore, DC, and uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, Central Maryland, which is like Columbia, Howard County. And then we have um, Prince George's County and the District of Columbia all have individual AUGS chapters. Well, they all came together along with the Washington DC Family History Center in Kensington and put on a Black History Genealogy Conference, which was, they've been doing it for years. And of course this year it was virtual, but that was just done last Saturday. Yeah. And the wealth of information, um, and I encourage you to join you do not have to, like, for instance, I don't have Maryland ancestry, but I attend and I am a member of two Maryland chapters because the information, the sharing is invaluable. So right. don't, don't let it put you off. You know, Great. That. So Jennifer, thank you. Everyone's saying thank you. You've done an excellent job. And um, there are some questions here about uh, the Oakley Cabin. And yes, th there are a list of surnames for the Oakley Cabin. Um, in the chat, there was a question about that. Let's see if there's any more questions. Do you have a search preference? That's what someone's uh, asking. Is there a preference that you have when you're using your search, Jennifer, when you're doing searching? Um, I guess they mean, do I use, uh, which search engine uh, do I use? I use Family Search and Ancestry. I use Family Search a lot because they there's no pay firewall. Ancestry is a membership, and so um, there are some records, many of their records are locked up behind a paywall, and it can be quite expensive. So I use Family Search, but I also use um, uh, uh, other databases that are free. And once you, uh, if you go to the Maryland resource page um, that I put in the uh, in the handout, that will send you to a lot of other resources that are free. And okay. many of the archives and the libraries because of COVID are now, if you have a library card, you can access the library version of Ancestry for free. Okay. So uh, I know Pratt 
Baltimore Library, Pratt Library, Enoch Pratt. You can get a digital library card and then that enables you to tap into their ancestry database. Okay, someone's mentioning a familyecho.com. Have you used that before? I am not familiar with that. Is that a testing or is that? Um, no, it looks sounds like it's a search for African Americans. Um, that's on the best one for African Americans, like Family Echo. Um, someone's mentioning tra Tracy. No, I have not used that. A lot of um, you can get a lot of information. I, again, like I said, by going on Facebook and just typing in the query uh, African American genealogy, and all the the sites will come up, and you right. can just pick and choose. You know what sounds interesting to you. So, so there were some questions here, not particularly um, um, just to address them. I, um, we're, we'll, there are star names for the Oakley cabin that we'll be researching and we'll do that in the summer. Um, so we don't have the names, we won't, we won't be seeing them here tonight, but um, we'll be able to share that information with you uh, about the surnames that are um, connected to Oakley cabin. Um, and someone's asking you, they're saying, thank you. Um, yes, the meeting is recorded, so it will be available for replay. We'll get that up as soon as we can. Um, someone's asking how did a three generation, how do you do, how do you record a second marriages? Is there a way that you record second marriages? There are, there are forms, um, that will allow you to do that. And then also when you go online, if you use a, there are family trees that are now, you know, digitized and on Ancestry and on Family Search. Um, I, I didn't mention that, but Family Search and Ancestry do have online trees where you can chart out your entire family and they do allow you to put in stepchildren, uh, second marriages, um, all kinds of every situation you can think of. They're right. not easy necessarily to find, but they are out there. They are. And so if you all are interested, I'm reading some of the information from the chats, but um, there is another resource in here listed called enslaved.org, which Katrina is sharing that someone recently released lots of records from. Uh, yeah, enslaved.org is out of, um, I believe it's Minnesota, um, but one of the gentlemen that works on it, Daryl Williams, is uh, here at the University of Maryland. And um, his primarily research is um, centers on Brazil and the connection to the enslaved people in Brazil. But it's a it's another great resource, and it's it's not a beginner's resource, but it is a great resource. <laughs> yeah. So everyone, we're so glad you all um, participated in this workshop, and we want to keep with you know time. We're going to end at eight o'clock this evening. And so we look forward to you um, participating in all of our workshops in you know, the latter part of the year. Summer will be focusing a lot on our Oakley Cabin um, descendants and we'll do an emancipation celebration. And we have things coming up starting in April. So look on our historyintheparks.org to register for our opening event that we generally do in April. And we'll have all kinds of events like basket weaving and basket making and um, uh, uh, we're going to be making some gourd bird houses and uh, so we're going to really tie it all in and get people engaged in some of these things and hopefully we'll be able to be on site at the beautiful Oakley cabin in the park and everyone will be able to if you haven't been able to visit you're able to visit those sites um, on your own um, when the weather breaks uh, but you can go out there and see, you won't be able to go in, but you'll actually be able to, you know, actually see the sites. Um, some of those sites are available for your, your access currently as a, as a outdoor parks, because they're all engaged uh, as part of park, a, a park. So we really thank you all for joining us and we hope you had a wonderful evening. And so we'll be saying good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you everyone.